Today we begin a series of new studies, or a new series of studies, that is the Sutta Discovery, volume 48. Right. This volume, the theme is Death and Mindfulness. And now usually if we study in, in a class, once a week we study uh, one short sutta, part of a long sutta or essay. It takes about three months to cover the whole book. But uh, in this series, I will usually just give a, a short talk, so about less than half an hour, so that's convenient for people to listen. So in other words, it might take about double the time, say about six months to finish the whole volume. Of course, you don't have to listen to all of the recordings. If you're not inclined to, you can select topics which interest you. Today, we're going to look at the first part of chapter one, which is about karma and the afterlife. These are very fascinating topics. Not to say easy topics, they can be quite difficult. Some of the things I I'm going to say it would be quite speculative, but based on the suttas, based on the Buddha's teachings. So here is where, when we talk about karma, when we talk about death, these are two topics which can be very difficult to verify. So as far as possible, we try to look at these two key topics in Buddhism, in life in fact, from the background of the early suttas. Now, <clears throat> karma, there are two main teachings in Buddhism would be karma and rebirth. But here we're going to look at rebirth in the sense of the ending of this death. But when we talk about that, uh, it also implies rebirth in other words. Now, for today, we focus basically some cultural aspects of, of death and rebirth. How Buddhism as a cultural phenomenon or as cultural phenomena view death, view karma and rebirth, if you like. Now, if you look at the early Buddhist texts in the suttas, how the Buddha talks about uh, death, what does he talk about? One of the uh, one of the keywords or one of the uh, beings involved in, in death would be the pretas. The preta is an English word. It has become English. That is the way we, we use it here. It is also a Sanskrit word. Preta. The Pali word is peta. So here, this, this word preta, of course, was already there in India before the Buddha's time. And uh, if you look at the word preta, it comes from the word to cross over, ita, or, or tara, the, to, to cross over, like tarati means to cross over, say, water especially. And then there are prefixes, the prefix pa and the plus infix e to show kind of uh, uh, something intense, something uh, connected together. Uh, here, of course, it refers to a being, a being that has departed. So today, of course, in English we say the departed. So it's just a kind of perfect translation. That's the original sense of the word of peta, if you like. But over time, as we know, the idea of the peta evolved. And uh, just a, a quick overview. So we find the earliest idea of Preta in India would be simply the departed. And then when it came to Southeast Asia, uh, just before that, before Buddhism spread outside uh, India, already ideas of uh, different kinds of Pretas came into being. And then when it spread to Southeast Asia, you have this, the notion that the, the dead, uh, we, we can pray for the dead, we can even dedicate merits for the dead and so on. And when this idea went to China, it became even more complicated, it became more sinicized, 
the Chinese have a habit of converting Buddhism, converting religion into their lifestyle. And very often in China, whatever religion that goes there, to be synthesized means to have conversion values and, and Taoist ideas. And then you find Chinese Buddhism, there's a lot of this kind of ideas. And, and generally, Chinese Buddhism also believe in the soul, unlike the Indian uh, teachings. So it, you begin to see something very different there. In fact, uh, in, in China, for example, we almost don't have the idea that there is anything beyond the next life. Someone dies and that's the next life, full stop, that's it. The relative is dead and they are reborn. And, and the strange thing about Chinese uh, Buddhist beliefs or Chinese belief in general, so once a person is dead, this person seems to go to, to a lower world. And it seems always to be a kind of hell state or preta state. And, and these two seems to be combined or overlap. This is the general uh, idea, although uh, the specialists will say, oh no, you know, this is not the way it should be. Of course, so you have two ideas. One is what the people actually believe and the other is what the specialists and the teachers think. So anyway, coming back to the Indian idea of Pretas, the idea, of course, came very much earlier uh, with the Brahmin beliefs where when someone dies, or in this case they normally focus on the head of the family, when the father, the patriarch dies, he's caught, he's left in a, a certain state, a kind of a Preta state, so he's departed, and he's stuck there like a limbo. So the eldest son and no one else, only the eldest son, has to perform special ceremonies and this ceremony became more complicated over time because understandably the, the Brahmins introduced this kind of rituals and it's a very good way of uh, making money, getting donations and of course uh, controlling the religious crowd. So the ritual became more complicated, it involved more people, more chants and so on. So, from this being, this prayer the departed, must receive the prayers of the elder son in order to be free from their state and to go higher, maybe become a deva, go into some higher realm and so be free, so to speak. Otherwise, oh, here you have different kinds of beliefs coming in. You have this preta might come back and haunt the family or become a kind, some kind of troublesome or mischievous spirit. So these are beliefs uh, on a cultural level. Of course, uh, some of these ideas, in, in, in a way or in many ways, crept back into Buddhism. And in later times, especially after the Buddha passed away, you begin to see a kind of Brahminization of Buddhism. Uh, you be, for example, Buddhism started using Sanskrit and then you have Tibetan Buddhism, you have the fire puja and so on. So you know, what the Buddha rejected crept back into Buddhism, so to speak, by the later uh, teachers and innovators. But that's another story. We have, of course, in early Buddhism, or at least this thread in early Buddhism, which tries, which does keep to the original teachings, you know, if you like, the, the basic teachings as found in the suttas. Those, those teachings can still be found there if we carefully study the suttas with help of commentaries and also uh, with some consultation with the meditating monks, the monks of the contemplative forest traditions. So, this uh, pretas, according to the early Brahmins, when they die, they arrive in, in, in the, well, what we can call today the world of the fathers, the Pitara. And there, again, they have this mythology, King Yama is waiting there, or this god Agni, who the fire is there. So again, here the story varies. So here again, we see this personification of death, for example, in the form of King Yama. 
And they got acne. It's very interesting because, as you know, in ancient India, they cremate the dead. So fire, fire is regarded as something sacred, something purificatory, something that purifies. So there is this god of fire, acne, and so on. But in Buddhism, uh, the, the Buddha used the idea of yama, king yama, to personify, uh, one might say, karma. Because if you look at the suttas that talk about King Yama, for example, the Yama Sutta and then all the suttas related to King Yama in the Majjhima Nikaya and so on, uh, which we will be properly dealing with here in due course. For example, in chapter 10, there's a Yama Devaduta Sutta and so on, which we will cover in some detail in due course. So here, uh, the Buddha incorporated the idea of yama as a kind of, not so much as a judge, more as a reminder of, of the dead when they, are, they come before him. Uh, it's almost like he's asking, why have you come before me? Uh, would you see all these signs in the world of impermanence and, and that you should be doing good so that you don't come before me and you have to suffer in this terrible place called the hells? Right, so that's King Yama. Okay? And the uh, interesting thing is, uh, King Yama is not someone permanent because, as you know, in Buddhism everything is impermanent. So it's, it's more like an office, a role that he holds uh, to remind the dead, in, in a sense, uh, not to commit all those wrong acts, bad acts which have brought them before him. And of course, the reality now, what is very interesting is we have to treat Buddhist texts as literature is, who is watching all this? Who is the audience? You and I are the audience. In other words, the, all these stories are meant to instruct us, educate us, to live a life that is wholesome and, and moral, so that we do not fall into the subhuman states and have to face King Yama and he's going to ask us all these difficult questions. So even the idea of the dead here is uh, quite dynamic, quite positive in a sense that uh, we, we are reminded to live the good life before we move on. So uh, these praetas, in other words, they, they, are, they, are, they are a different kind of being. They are not the hell beings. This is a kind of little idea uh, in the Buddha's time where the praetas have their own realm, so to speak. So you have the hell realm, which is characterized by violence. The Preta world is characterized by bad karma. Those that perform a lot of bad karma, so uh, they fall into that state. And what's, it's a kind of liminal dead state. It's like a kind of in-between state. We don't have an idea of purgatory in Buddhism, but uh, this is the closest you have to that kind of idea where the preta becomes the karma, the bad karma that he habitually has done, has been doing in the previous life. For example, uh, in the Pretawa 2, we have lots of stories, descriptions of the pretas. Uh, we have, for example, a preta whose mouth is full of maggots and, and, and rotting away, but he doesn't die. So it's because in the previous life he was he was misusing his speech, all the negative way of speaking. So it's about that kind of mouth. And then you have this uh, a nun, nun preta who has been living a immoral life. So she's flying to the air, and the ropes are burning. So we can see here, interestingly, it's apparently that the pretas do have some kind of powers, like flying around like birds, but they are suffering. So we have this, uh, in other words, there is no fixed description of a preta. They appear the way that their bad karma uh, has, been, has been accumulated over time as a bad habit, as a negative, unwholesome habit, in other words. So, so this kind of idea is very popular in ancient India, and then it, it kind of spread over to Southeast Asia and wherever people follow the Theravada teaching or the Buddhism. 
So here, uh, up to this point, we can say the Buddhists never worship the dead. So in other words, technically speaking, strictly speaking, there is no ancestral worship. Unless we take the word ancestor worship in a broad sense, meaning to simply uh, help the dead to move on or to have a, a better rebirth. We must not just remember in the background of all this that we are talking, there is this teaching of rebirth. Even the Preta state is impermanent. So the next question, a simple question we can ask is, how do we help the, these Pretas to be uplifted from their suffering state. How do they get out of their suffering state? So this is one question uh, we will briefly answer today and then in the next few talks or so we will come back to this very interesting question. Now, so th these prayers, they are suffering because they've been creating a lot of bad karma by way of the ten kinds of wrong actions, like three of the body, four of speech, and, and uh, three more by with the mind, the, the Akusula Karma Pata. Okay? So they become their bad karma. It, it's almost, it's, it's like they, they are facing their karmic retribution. No one is punishing them. They have fallen into that kind of state because of their own actions. Now this idea is very important to understand. So let me use a simple explanation. Let's say someone has been killing animals. He's a hunter. So you can imagine the way he lives. So he's stealthy, looking for prey to kill. And it's his mind always has this idea of killing and killing, of course, you have some kind of uh, definitely either greed, hate, or definitely delusion is there. And he habitually kills. So in other words, although he has a human body, his mind is like a hell being, intent on killing, on destruction, on violence. So this is one example. Right? So with that kind of mind, in a human body, so then he dies. What is it dies? It's the human body that dies, that runs out of date. The sharp life is reached. So what remains is what kind of mind remains? It's this hell being mind, this violent mind. So this mind moves on and seeks a new shell, a new body to exist in. So what kind of body would it seek? Well, because of its nature of being violent, it will seek, it will be attracted to a violent place. It will be sort of uh, sucked into this violent place called the hell. So this is one way of explaining it, how beings are born. So in that sense, karmic retribution occurs through our own actions, not anyone putting it on us or making us suffer, in other words. So, coming back to the Pretas then, so it, even though we talk about Preta realm, it is not like a Deva realm, uh, say the gods of the 33, they have a certain place, and they live together. These uh, Pretas are as disparate as human beings today are. So they can exist anywhere. And then the, there is no it's more like a wavelength that it exists in, a kind of uh, time-space dimension, continuum, if you like. So this is how they, in that sense, they are a realm. Okay? Of course, maybe in certain places there are more operators than others, that's possible too. Um, generally speaking, operators do not trouble human beings because they are four different realms. Of course, some people, because of their nature, psychological nature, they may be able to see such betas and if their understanding is wrong and they have a lot of bad karma themselves, of course they'll be negatively affected by such betas if they happen to see them. Whereas if you are a trained Buddhist, you're a Buddhist 
practitioner, you'll be taught that these pratas, they like trouble neighbors. They are, they are like less fortunate neighbors. So, uh, in a sense, we can help them. The question now is, how do we help them? Why, first of all, why do they need our help? Now, some an, another interesting point about the pratas is that, uh, according to the sutta, called the Akkana Sutta. Anguttara 8.29, the spectators are among those who will not be able to benefit from listening to Dharma. They will not be able to pay attention, they, they will not be able to listen because they are so engrossed in uh, their difficulties, their karmic struggle and pains. Uh, imagine uh, they are not able to take food the way we take and uh, sometimes they are kept cries as ever hungry. Imagine you, you're always hungry but you don't die but, but you keep having a kind of feeling so it's, it's really terrible to kind of uh, live like that. Uh, so they're not able to benefit from the Buddha's teaching according to the, the Sutta. But there is something that can help them, that is loving kindness. Loving kindness is this wonderful quality which is universally healing. That is why it's very important uh, for us as human beings to cultivate loving kindness. Uh, if we are thinking of our dearly departed those we love who have passed on or we are performing some kind of uh, final rites or a memorial rites it's very important that we cultivate loving kindness we do this by of course in a normal way may I be well, may I be happy we start with ourselves happy positive thoughts and then we recall the good qualities of this person and then we kind of like send out these happy thoughts to this wonderful person. The question now is, will this person receive it? If this person is a praetor and this person is nearby, the likelihood is very much higher that this person would feel that loving kindness. Here again, a simple analogy would explain the situation. Now imagine we are that praetor floating around uh, still kind of uh, still stuck with the, the old place that we like we are still haunting this place we just uh, we keep coming back to the place we are familiar with our families even but of course we can't communicate with anyone but when we see our loved ones who are still living sending out loving thoughts in our memory mentioning our names thinking of us we feel a sense of connection. We have no language that we can use. We have no way of uh, communicating, but we can feel this wonderful feeling that our living relatives are emanating. And once the preta is able to cut, it generate these happy thoughts, they fall from their negative state, or rather they, are, they get out of their negative state and they continue to proceed with their good karma usually. And this is what we, the details can be found in the Tiro Kuda Sutta, uh, in the Kudaka Bata. So, that is about the Pretas and how we can help. The Tiro Kuda Sutta is in Kudaka Bata 7 and also in the Petawa 2, 1.5. So here again, just one uh, last point. The praetors cannot receive any offerings directly offered to them because they are of a different world altogether. It's just like my cat. Long ago I had this beautiful cat. This cat one day brought a rat to me and uh, put it at my feet. I was still among them. And I realized this cat actually was making an offering to giving me this food which cats eat, but of course we humans, we don't eat that kind of food. So, same thing, the kind of food that we take, the 
betas cannot consume. So, in other words, the beta is in a kind of a disembodied state where their minds are really tortured and troubled. So they need lots of loving kindness. They need dedication of merits. Remember, from my understanding, the dedication of merits only work if there is loving kindness. Without loving kindness, it is it's just words, rituals, and it won't help the victims in any way. So we need to have this loving kindness to empower this uh, dedication of merit. Nothing is transferred here. There's no such thing as transfer of merit. It's a wrong idea which we should not think about. Rather, we dedicate this, whatever good you have done, in the name of the deceased, wishing the deceased well and happy. In that way, we help this deceased by reaching out to their minds, so to speak, to their hearts, so to speak, and they uplift themselves from the, those negative states. So this is something worth remembering and something worth thinking about. And this is where I've stopped. And next, next stop, we go on to section 1.2 and so on. Okay? So, oh yes, just as a reminder, I mean, oh, it would be good for you if you download this book from the internet at amatharad.org so you can read for yourself as uh, after listening to the talk or before listening to the talk. Let us now do a short reflection. Reflection on death is a very useful practice. It reminds us that uh, our time is always limited in this world. So because it is limited, it is precious to us. So we have to use it why use this time wisely. There's always time if we value it. There's always time if we do good and uh, somehow we will always find time if, for example, we are studying the suttas or meditating. Even the short while that we spend doing such good things are worthwhile. And then before you know it, it is gone. But although the time is gone, we have planted these wonderful seeds and they are growing into beautiful trees and blossoming with their wholesome fruits. So this is the blessing of impermanence when we do good things. So reflecting in this way is wonderful good karma. But about such karma, may we be blessed with wisdom, with the wisdom and courage to aspire to stream winning in this life itself. By the same token, by the goodness of the three jewels, let us send out our loving kindness to all our loved ones, to all the beings. Yeah, may they be well and happy. And to those who have been kind to us and supporting us, we do be well and happy too. And also now let us send our loving kindness to all those people who are seeking the truth, struggling with Buddhism, may they see the true teaching in this life itself. May all beings be well and happy. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu.